So let me kick off. Good morning, I'm Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Emory Executive Education at Goizueta Business School. And thank you for joining us today as we continue our Business Over Breakfast series and our August theme of leadership communication. As I mentioned last week, Roberto C. Goizueta, our namesake and the former chairman and CEO of the Coca-Cola Company, once said, communication is the only task a leader cannot delegate. And these days, it's harder and harder. Mm -hmm. We approach today's communication topic, which is the urgency epidemic. I hope each of us takes a moment to reflect on the urgency in all of our lives, both that which we create and which others create for us. Many extol the virtues of acting with a sense of urgency, yet when everything is urgent, without understanding what's important, I think we increase the risk of achieving other frustration and exhaustion. So how can leaders properly use urgency to motivate rather than burn out their teams? Our discussion today looks at the question around can there be too much urgency? To guide us in this, we are pleased to have Brandon Smith, uh, alumni and affiliate faculty at Goizueta Business School. Brandon is a leading expert in leadership communication and workplace dysfunction. Uh, he must be very busy today, Brandon. Uh, he's known as the workplace therapist. He's a sought after executive coach, TEDx speaker, and award-winning instructor. In his recent book, The Hot Sauce Principle, Brandon explores the power of urgency and how to ensure that we don't create too much of it. Our goal today, as with all of our Business Over Breakfast webinars, is to provide relevant ideas to help you navigate the uncertainty of our COVID-19 world. Our hope is that through these webinars and other learning initiatives that we're offering, that we as leaders can better position ourselves, our teams and our businesses to not only survive, um, but to thrive as we emerge into the next normal. For those who have joined us before, um, welcome back. For those joining us for the first time, uh, Brandon will spend about 30, 35 minutes sharing practical insights on leadership communication, trust building and navigating urgency. And this will be followed by about 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A time. We invite you to post your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen at any time. And our team will do their best to uh, get as many of these questions answered as we can. At the end of today's session, there'll be a short five uh, question survey that we really appreciate you uh, filling in as this helps us uh, uh, determine uh, what other topics uh, to make available to you. Um, I invite you also to join us at, in another online workshop series that starts October 21st with Brandon and others called Executive Communications and Leadership Presence, which will go further into the topic that Brandon um, is exploring today and other faculty at Coswell will be expanding on. We'll be sure to post a link to that um, in the comments where you can find uh, that more information on that workshop. In the meantime, enjoy your morning and welcome Brandon. Thank you. Nicola, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome. I am so excited about our topic today, uh, overcoming the urgency epidemic. So as Nicola said, my goal for us today is to just dive into this topic and I'm gonna provide you some practical ways to think about how do you create the right amount of urgency with your teams? And in some cases, when urgency is being, being pushed on you, how can you properly manage that, redirect that, so you don't feel the burnout that is associated with too much urgency? So to kind of uh, get us started here, I really got just two big objectives for us today. Uh, how do we more effectively manage urgency? That's what we're really gonna discuss over the next 30, 35 minutes or so. And then uh, my goal is that everyone on this call here today in this webinar take away one concept from today. Uh, now, uh, sticking with this idea of urgency, my experience has been with all the leaders that I've worked with and the organizations that I've touched over the years, that in recent years, uh, particularly pre-COVID, but I would argue even during COVID, uh, that two things are true. First, uh, time is everyone's most precious resource. It's not money, it's time. And second, everything is urgent all the time. So in that whirlwind, 
uh, I would rather you leave our call today with one item you really want to focus on or put in play or continue to think about rather than a list of 10. Uh, because when everything's urgent all the time, uh, focus is going to be key. Um, so with this as kind of big objectives, this is just some more general housekeeping in case some of you came in um, a little bit later. I'd recommend maybe having a pen and paper handy or some other way to just capture notes. Um, as Nicholas said, I'm going to be covering uh, multiple concepts today, uh, really kind of giving you kind of a sampler platter of, of ways to manage urgency and to improve your leadership communication. Um, so it might be good to grab a couple notes on some of those things you want to hold on to. Uh, of course, you know, um, responding to we're using the Q&A and putting in any questions you have. Um, I will be taking those uh, live if, if appropriate, so we don't have to wait all the way to the end. Um, so feel free to jump in if there's a question about something I'm talking about, something I could clarify, uh, or just something you're curious about. Um, and then lastly, would love to get your questions. I mean, this is going to be most beneficial when this really is a conversation uh, versus me just kind of talking at you. Uh, I'm going to give you some concepts, but it's your view of those concepts, how you see them play out in your life, which kind of help us all learn and get smarter. So uh, don't be shy. Uh, okay, so with that is kind of a, a, a backdrop, uh, I would love to open with a poll. So uh, if it's possible, I'd love to get our kind of poll to pull up uh, to really kind of take on these questions. How much urgency do you feel today? Consider work and at home. So uh, really, you can see the three, the four options here. Okay. Interesting. There's, there's a few of you that are uh, pretty relaxed, <laughs> don't have too much urgency. But most folks either feel a moderate or um, a moderate amount or, or a moderate to high amount of urgency. Again, I'll give a few more, a few more seconds to see if we have time for everyone to answer the poll. All right, looks like it's starting to slow down a little bit. Okay, so we can see there, the, the leader is, uh, we've got kind of most things feel urgent. Excellent, everybody. So you can see this, most things feel urgent. You've got, again, eight people that are uh, pretty low amount of urgency, um, 62 moderate, and then 25, everything feels urgent, but most things feel urgent. Okay, great, excellent. Uh, we can stop sharing that, wonderful. So um, we're gonna kind of continue down our path here a little bit. And I'm going to just pull this over to the side and get the poll out of the way for me. Okay. So I don't do any uh, conversations around uh, leadership communication without hitting a few kind of core principles of, of leadership communication. So I want to open with a few of these core principles. They'll pour a nice foundation for us as we talk about this concept of managing urgency. But they're also just fundamental principles that you can apply in lots of other elements they'll help you become a better communicator. So our first one here is leadership is about answering the why questions. Management is about answering the how questions. So when we're truly wearing the leader hat, we're answering the why questions. We're explaining why we're going down this path and not this path, why we're making this decision and not this decision. Uh, now, when we're really trying to teach someone how to do something, we're, you know, we're wearing that management hat, we're explaining how we want something to be done. And naturally, if we're wearing that management hat all the time and explaining how all the time, People, people might often call us micromanagers, and we, we know we don't like that. So let me explain a little bit more about um, this, this concept of why and my favorite story to illustrate the point. So uh, several years ago, I was doing work with an IT security company, uh, and their uh, business model is they work with large organizations to secure either customer data and patient data so it can't be compromised or hacked. So as they, as they put it, they said, you know, our job is to stop the bad guys. Uh, and inside the company, it's made up of two kinds of people. We've got folks with really strong IT skills, um, naturally, to kind of uh, secure that data. And then we also have individuals that have former military or counter-terrorist backgrounds. So an interesting kind of add-on to their culture. So I was at their corporate office, and I was getting ready to prepare for an offsite I was doing with the group. And I was interviewing leaders. And one of the leaders I interviewed was a retired colonel from the U.S. Army who had been in the Army his whole career. And his last job was he was doing something very similar for the Army's data. And he'd retired primarily to be closer to his sons who were in college. And I was just kind of curious. And I said, Colonel, what, what was it like to go from a military career, your whole career, to now working for this civilian company? That had to have been a hard transition. 
and he looked at me and he said, yeah, it was a really hard transition. He said, the hardest thing about it is we don't communicate well around here at all. And he told me the story. He said, um, back um, around the time of the Iraq war, the, the U.S. Army changed how they gave commands. They realized the world had gotten too complicated and too complex. They, they use an acronym. Um, you may have heard this before. It's VUCA, V-U-C-A, to describe the world. And it stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. He said, the world's gotten way too VUCA. We can't give these top-down, very you know, uh, um, directive kind of um, commands. We can't do that anymore. So we went to something called Commander's Intent. If you've spent any time with my colleague, Ken Keen, uh, he talks about Commander's Intent quite, quite regularly. And so Commander's Intent, the idea is whenever there was a new mission or objective, the commanding officer, he or she, would call a meeting with their direct reports and their direct reports, direct reports, so two levels in the meeting, and they would issue Commander's Intent for that mission. And Commander's Intent is the why of the mission, the what of the mission, and the when of the mission but they stay away from the how of the mission because there's way too many variables on the battlefield. But if everyone leaves that room aligned on the why, the what, the when, then no matter what gets thrown at them, they're gonna be able to move, move together in a uniform way. And another a principle, particularly in the US Army, is bias for action. So you can stop and reflect, but you gotta keep moving forward. Um, so the Colonel finished that story with me and he said, he said around here at this company, we're lucky if, if any of that stuff gets covered. And, and if it does, only half the people that show up need to be there. So I love that image of commander's intent to illustrate the importance of why. Um, and if I'm thinking about my, my role as an executive coach over the last five years, I've not had one executive coaching client that I, I have not included somewhere on her or his action plan. Make sure you're communicating your commander's intent to your team. So that's our first principle. Uh, our, our second principle won't need near as much explanation, uh, nor does it really even need a story. In absence of communication, people almost always assume the worst. And I don't think there's probably a more truer time for this statement than, than the last three or four months we've been living in. Um, so I think it's as leaders, it's really important that we don't leave long kind of vacuums of, of communication because people will, will fill that in with uh, the worst case scenario in their mind. All right, principle number three. Dysfunction is like a fungus that lives in dark places. We want to clarify our expectations to eliminate it. So um, while I wear lots of hats, my primary purpose and passion in the world is one singular thing, and that is to eliminate all workplace dysfunction everywhere forever. And so it hit me not too many years ago that workplace dysfunction, particularly on the people side of that, um, 50, you can present, prevent 50% per of all workplace dysfunction, people related, by clear expectations. Being really, really clear on what you expect, but also really, really clear on what they expect. Because more often than not, when we have dysfunction or we have missteps at work, uh, it is because people have, have not been clear on expectations. So clarity on expectations is a tremendous, tremendous gift. Principle four. Uh, leadership is about striving for being efficient and effective. We're always trying to strike this balance of efficiency and effectiveness. And so if you think about that a little bit, just kind of, kind of get this idea in your head, can you be efficient and not effective? Well, yeah, you can be efficient and not effective. Right? We can spend our days on email and maybe you know, doing things, but not doing the things we need to be doing. And the same is true the other way around. We can be effective and not efficient. You know, we, we can take too long to make a decision or take too long to reach agreement. So, so it's always striking that balance. Now, why this particular principle is important for our topic today is when we live in a world where urgency is very prevalent, okay, it will push us down the efficiency path. It's going to push us to, to, to value efficiency over effectiveness. And if we're not careful, we can end up making mistakes. We go too fast. We miss things. Often where I see that come in is uh, leaders, frankly, will forget to communicate. They'll, they'll forget to communicate in the right order with the right people, or they'll leave somebody out, and that causes issues. So we want to make sure we're always trying to balance this efficiency and, and effectiveness. Okay, a few more principles for us today. So leadership is about moving from working in the business to on the business. Um, I, I, we've kind of borrowed this from our friends in the small business entrepreneurial space. This is a common kind of mantra in that world. So, you know, imagine if, you know, if you, you opened a bakery and it was the most popular bakery in town and everyone's coming for miles to your bakery. Well, the, the natural, logical next step is, well, let's open up a sister bakery on the other side of town. Um, but if you're the baker, that's a problem. 
So it's always going from working in the business to on the business. Okay, so urgency. If we even take this concept and apply it to urgency, our topic today, urgency also will pull us down into the weeds. It, it will make us firefighters. Most of us probably feel we're more like firefighters than actually leaders a lot of the time. And so the idea is how do we kind of stay on the business and not in it? So one of the simple concepts that I, I love to teach my clients and my students is this idea of author versus editor. So I want to share it with you right now today. It's a great tool to kind of help you as you're kind of managing this dynamic and keeping yourself on the business rather than in it. So whenever there's a, um, a, a dynamic with a direct report and a leader, okay, so there's, you're having a meeting, it's a leader and a direct report, uh, or even a service provider and a, and a client, in that dynamic, okay, there are two seats. And someone always has to sit in each of those seats. So there's the author seat and the editor seat, and both those seats have to be filled. And so the key is knowing who, is, who you need to be sitting in. Or should you be sitting in the author seat or the editor seat? As the leader, uh, the majority of the time, you want to be sitting in the editor seat and have your direct report sit in the author seat. And it makes perfect sense when you think about your all-time best direct reports. They probably came to you and they said, hey, here's a problem. Here's what I think we should do about it. I'd love to get your thoughts. They're authoring a solution and they're allowing you to edit. Now, your less than effective direct reports are going to come to you and say, hey, there's a problem. What do you want me to do about it? And they're baiting you in to be the author. And they want you to fix the problem or tell them what to do. And when you do that, when you sit in the author seat, guess what seat they get to sit in? The editor seat. So then they can say, well, it's not my problem that it didn't work out. Brandon told me to do it that way. There's no ownership, there's no initiative, there's no critical thinking. Those are all traits of authors. So you want to be sitting in the editor seat as much as possible. So next time you have a direct report come to you and say, well, what do you want me to do about it? Rather than jumping in and solving it for them, pause for a minute and say, you know what, why don't you put your best thinking around that and come back to me with a plan and let's talk about it. Encourage them to be authors. Now, one final point around this. As, as leaders, there are two things that only you can author. And it's really important that you do author. So the first one is strategy slash priorities. So what are the key things everyone needs to be focused on? Making sure you're not making everything a priority. We're gonna talk about that today. That's when everything's urgent. That's not helpful. That, that creates confusion rather than focus. Nicola kind of mentioned that early on in the beginning of our conversation today. So strategy slash priorities. And the second thing that only you can author is culture. Setting the culture for your team. So as a leader, those are really you working on the business, strategy and culture versus in the business and doing the little day-to-day -day stuff. So a simple principle, but a really powerful one. If you use it right, it will help you change how you use your time. Uh, and then here's our last principle for our conversation today. Leaders put energy into a system. Um, so one of my colleagues at, at the business school, at Goisweta, has got one of those classic business school slides where one column is all the traits of managers and the column is all the traits of leaders. And they're both, they're all great traits, but, uh, but they're very different traits. So for example, the manager traits are things like systems and structures and process and procedures and accountability, all things we like. Leader traits uh, are very different. They're things like inspires, motivates, leads change, sets vision, all energy actions. So when we're truly wearing the leader hat, we're putting energy into a system. And knowing what energy to put in at the right time is really important. Knowing when to be calm, when the, when the seas are really rocky, knowing when to create a little bit of urgency. As, as a, a client of mine several years ago, she was a general manager for a luxury retail store. She said, I know I need to light a fire in my people, which is inspiration, but sometimes I need to light a fire under them too, which is urgency. So we'll be spending some time today talking about how do you properly light some of those fires? Okay, so hey, those Brandon. are, yes, Pam. Um, we have a question that's come in that I thought you might want to address now. And that is, what advice do you have to manage up for leaders to step into the editor role and allow team members to be the author? Okay, Pam, say that for me one more time. Sure. What advice do you have for managing up in terms of getting your leaders to step into the editor role and allow team members to be the author. Excellent. So an interesting kind of flip on this. My boss is getting two in the weeds, and I really want to take more ownership and initiative around that. So the advice I would have is don't view your leader, the person you support, as your leader or your boss. View them as your number one client. 
because they are. Uh, and, and so if we're, if that's our client, then we want to practice really strong client management. So don't, so you take the lead on the dance floor. Don't let them. So set up a meeting, say, I want to present to you some ideas, some recommendations. I want to keep you updated on what's going on. So um, rather than waiting for them to set those meetings, you set the meetings and always come prepared with a one pager to present to them. Some leaders, if you don't do that, they'll kind of take the reins and start kind of telling you what to do. Structure the conversation with kind of a one pager, just like you would with a client. Say, here's the situation. Uh, here's what I recommend that we, that we do going forward. Uh, and, and I found that that works really, really well in kind of forcing them to sit in the editor seat. And, and frankly, um, if you do it well, which I'm sure you will, they really like that. It's, it's a much better use of time. Thank you, Pam, for the, for the, for the question. Okay, so uh, we're going to dive in here into um, an important first step in this process. If we're going to create urgency and if we're going to manage urgency that's coming on us, there has to be some level of trust in order for us to be able to properly use urgency. So this was a trust formula I came up with a little over 10 years ago. I was teaching at Emory uh, and I was trying to think about how do you take this fuzzy concept of trust and turn it into a mathematical equation? Uh, so a way that you, know, you could kind of look at it. And this was ultimately how, what I settled on. It's authenticity plus vulnerability times credibility gets us trust. Now, when I first created this formula, I didn't do it this way. I did it as a straight up addition formula. I made it authenticity plus vulnerability plus credibility, and it crashed and burned. I had to turn it into this multiplication formula. Um, so I'll, I want you to, I'll, I'll give you the answer as to why, but before I do that, I want you to kind of ask yourself, what is the importance of that multiplier? Why did I have to do that? So now that you've kind of two seconds to think about it, here's why. Because in the addition formula, you can have zero credibility and still come up with a positive trust output. And that's not how trust works. So the reason why the multiplier is in there, while, while it does honor the importance of credibility, it's there because if either side of that equation goes to zero, zero trust. So if you have no credibility, there's no trust, which makes sense to us. But if you have no authenticity and vulnerability, we also don't have trust. So you can have the greatest title in the world and look, look polished and kind of have the image of a leader. But if people don't really connect with you as kind of a human being, they're not going to fully trust you. So the idea is we want to make sure that we're, we're honoring these variables and trying to get something in those buckets. And the good news is you don't have to be perfect. You just can't go to zero on, on any of those. So uh, I want to share with you a little more detail on what I mean by credibility, authenticity, and vulnerability. And then we'll kind of uh, look at the formula one more time before we start to dive into how we can properly use this. So here we go, credibility. These are all ways we build credibility with our colleagues, with our leader, with our client, with, with other people. Uh, so we do it in, in, these, in these ways, past, past performance, consistency in actions and behaviors, reliability, frequency of communication, responsiveness of communication and follow through. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk about all these, but I do wanna talk about a couple. So the, the first one is, um, I'll open up with kind of a little mini story. Several years ago, a group of researchers took on this question. What's the worst kind of boss to work for? Worst kind of boss. Now, um, in, in kind of way of background, my background is somewhat eclectic. I have a clinical therapy background as well as an MBA. So it's kind of my version of a Reese's peanut butter cup. Somehow it kind of, it kind of works. Um, so given my clinical background, uh, my natural go-to was, it would be the angry, abusive, yelling and screaming, kind of pound the fist on the table boss would be number one. Um, that wasn't number one. Um, the micromanager wasn't number one. The, the ghosting boss you can never find, not number one. Number one was the highly inconsistent boss or the kind of unmedicated bipolar boss because you never knew what you were going to get. You know, you, you, back in the day so we could drive to work, you know, you're parked in your parking spot, you're gripping your steering wheel, you're about to go in and you're thinking to yourself, I, I could get a race today. I could also just as equally get fired today. So the highly inconsistent boss is the most difficult because you can't manage to that boss. You can manage to all the others. The angry and yelling and screaming boss, we know she or he's going to be angry and yelling and screaming. Or no, they're going to be a micromanager. Or no, we're not going to be able to find them. But you can't manage to highly inconsistent. So what's our takeaway for us? Particularly in times of unsteadiness, like the experiences we've been in the last few months, consistency is really key. 
consistency even down to your calendars. Like, so if you always meet with uh, Jan on Tuesdays at 10 a.m., then you have that as a standing meeting. The more consistent and predictable you are in your movements, the more that you're going to be seen as credible and trustworthy. Um, so the other one I want to t touch on is, uh, comes from um, a really good friend of mine. He teaches at um, Emory uh, for the BBAs. His name's John Kim. We, we got our MBAs together. Uh, and he, after his consulting days and he moved into the teaching world, um, he's got a great saying. He says, responsiveness is cheap currency. And what he means by that is responsiveness is the easiest way to build credibility with somebody fast. Just be super responsive. They send you an email, respond quickly. Um, now, what John's saying is be quick to respond. He's not saying you have to respond with the perfect answer. Because if you're like me, that's where you get hung up. You're thinking about the perfect answer or that's going to take a long time to explain. And so you just leave it in your inbox for a couple of days. And when we do that, in absence of communication, people assume the worst. They assume we don't care or we're overwhelmed or we're ignoring them. So John would say, just respond quickly. Say, I got it. I'll get back to you on Monday. And then make sure when Monday comes, you, you give them an answer, which is part of that predictability, reliability that we see in here. And then, of course, as managers and leaders, uh, follow through is also really, really key. You have a meeting with a direct report. You promise her or him something, uh, making sure you make good on that promise is also where we either gain or lose credibility. So and you can see on the little, the little blue box I popped up there, uh, you know, we, this is beyond title. We can gain this or lose this on a daily basis. So credibility is our, our first one here. Um, hey Brandon, the, yes, Pam. I've, I've got a question about credibility. So uh, one of our participants notes, I love the concept of leadership credibility as a focus item. Do you believe it's possible to earn or develop credibility without first earning leadership respect? Interesting. I do. I think you can earn credibility just by how you operate. So I think actually this would lead to leadership respect. So you're, you're going to be seen as um, respected when, when people can see a little more of your motions and movements and see the predictability around that. Uh, now, I would also say leadership respect is also going to come from our next item here, which is authenticity. Because authenticity, we could also use another proxy in there, and that's transparency. So when a leader makes, uh, I was having a conversation with a client yesterday, in fact, and, and sh her comment to me was very honest. She said, I just want to be liked. I really want to be liked. And so she's, she doesn't want to make a decision that someone else is not going to like. And, and I said, you know, you can make a decision that people don't like and still be respected if they see the process you took to get there. So part of the leadership respect is also transparency in the process. So I would say credibility is a component to get us to leadership respect, but so is this, this, this next one here. Um, and so authenticity, always we build authenticity with folks. Um, and here they are. You'll see the first one there, honesty and transparency, sharing our thinking, sharing our motives, showing genuine concern. Um, that's, and, and the leaders who have been really embracing authenticity during the last three or four months have been extremely successful uh, gaining even another level of respect from their teams, but even greater connection and trust. Um, you know, they're, they're asking more hum, human questions. They're, they're sharing more about their life. They're, they're sitting on their kitchen table and their kids are behind them. Um, sh uh, appropriate range of emotions, so showing a range of emotions appropriate for the situation, context, and culture. Again, this kind of hu humanity component. And then professionally real, being real and appropriate for, this, for the situation. Uh, okay. So this one's authenticity. Now, the last one is the one we like the least, and this is vulnerability. So these are all ways we practice vulnerability as leaders. And so you can see here, sharing an imperfect um, idea or a brainstorm for others to react, asking for help, stating I don't know, stating I was wrong or you were right, sharing or owning a mistake, and then sharing something personal when appropriate, like maybe part of your own personal story. And you'll notice the little blue box in the bottom left, uh, leadership vulnerability does not have to contain vulnerable emotions. I think we often think of those vulnerable emotions when we think of vulnerability. None of these items on this list have anything to do necessarily with emotions. They don't have to be emotional, but they are all forms of vulnerability. And I can almost guarantee as you're looking at that list, there's at least one of those you really don't like to do. So I would challenge you to kind of identify that one and, and really push yourself to try and embrace that a little bit more and, and find ways to live that out. And here's why it's so important, particularly as leaders. 
I want you to look at this list again. And now I want you to look at it through the lens of your team. Wouldn't you want your team members to be embracing all those concepts? You want them to bring an imperfect idea or brainstorm. You want them to ask for help before it's too late. You want them to stay, I, say, I don't know, or state I was wrong or you were right, or share or own a mistake, or share something personal when, when appropriate. You, you want that from your team. Well, they're not going to do those things if you don't model it for them. This is a different uh, talk than today, but when we talk about psychological safety, the, the, the trigger to create psychological safety in teams is for that leader to, to lead with some level of vulnerability. In other words, items like this. That helps to get people feel more comfortable and they kind of lower their guard. And it creates, allows things for innovation and other kinds of conversations. So this is the idea of, of vulnerability. So um, we're gonna go into this idea of mastering urgency, but I wanted to kind of lay out that trust formula first because it's, it's important as we move into this idea of, of lighting a fire under people that there is some level of trust in us first. Um, because when we think about things like urgency, urgency really is about um, creating a, um, when we do it the right way, it's about creating a healthy state of discomfort. And so when we create that, and this is why this whole concept of, of using urgency as leaders is advanced leadership stuff. Because more often than not as leaders, our job is to kind of solve pain points. We're gonna make things more comfortable, right? We're gonna put in systems or structures or, or create something to, to minimize chaos. We're gonna make things smoother and more comfortable. Urgency is all about the opposite of that. We're gonna take people that are perfectly comfortable and we're gonna make them uncomfortable on purpose so that we can stimulate proper action and change. Um, and for those of you who are um, kind of on this webinar today that have children, uh, I'm sure you can relate. There's probably been times when you looked at your kids and you said, oh yeah, they're way too comfortable. We need to make them uncomfortable. And you create urgency so they can grow, so we can go through change. So that sets up the importance of this, but we must have trust first because once those individuals feel that discomfort, they're gonna ask themselves, do I trust her or him enough to allow me to feel this way? So trust is kind of the foundational piece. So we're gonna move into this a little bit. This comes from Stephen Covey's kind of famous urgent versus important matrix. Uh, and you can see it's, it's a little bit different than what we're used to. Normally we say the goal is top right. In this case, the goal is um, top left. So the idea is that you wanna focus on things. You can see the X and Y axis here. The Y axis is importance. The X axis is urgency. And we wanna focus on the things that are high. So if it's important and urgent, so crises, pressing issues, we need to attend to those right now. That's really where we need to focus our energy. And then the other area that we wanna to go to is then on the top right, which is focus. So these are items that are important, but not urgent. These are things like strategy, values, things that are always there. We need to keep our eye on them, but aren't necessarily burning issues. And then as much as possible, the greens and the blues, we wanna delegate, outsource or say no to those. Delegate, outsource, and say no to the stuff that's in the green and the blue. These are things that are either low importance and low urgency or low importance and high urgency. But, you know, it's not something we necessarily need to spend our time on. So in a perfect world, we just focus on that orange primarily and keep our eye on the yellow. But when everything is urgent all the time, what it does to us is it, it, if it makes us view everything that comes our way as urgent and important. And I bet if you were gut level honest with yourself, sometime during this week, you responded quickly to an email that came into your inbox that was probably a blue or a green, but you responded quickly anyway because you just wanted to get it out of your inbox. You treated it like it was an orange, like it was high urgency and high importance, but it wasn't. So the goal is how can we really kind of focus on the things that truly are urgent and important? So here's a few urgency warnings. So right before uh, COVID kind of came into all of our worlds, um, I was planning to go speak at a kind of large national conference in Las Vegas. And so I was interviewing a group of business owners that were attending this conference. And so this was uh, five or 10,000 people were gonna be there. And so I was interviewing them on this concept of urgency. And they shared a few kind of warnings, particularly as leaders and kind of business owners. So here was the first warning. They said, being the hero encourages urgency and chaos. I thought this was a really interesting concept. And so for this kind of leader, this is what, this is what they said to me. He said, you know, you've, you've done all these jobs. They're easy for you and fun for you. You've gotten out of a mess a million times. 
you want to be and you like to be the hero. But if you want to move yourself to truly being a leader, you need to write a system so others can fix the problem. So our first warning is you can actually perpetuate urgency and create more fires and chaos in your world if you're always jumping in and rescuing everyone. It feels good, but it actually creates kind of a system of chaos and codependency, frankly. So the therapist in me comes out and says, that's not, that's not good. We don't want that. So, so that, that's our first warning. Second warning around this on how we can kind of uh, create too much urgency inadvertently in our world is unnecessary promises. So something urgent comes up, pause for a moment before you speak and make promises. Sometimes we take something not urgent, we make it urgent by overpromising. A customer comes in with a problem, you prom promise to have it done by the end of the day. Managing expectations and giving yourself time to respond is key to creating air in your calendar for the things that truly are urgent. So in other words, your boss asks for something and you really want to please her or him. So you say, oh, I'll get to you by the end of the day. They might not need it until Monday. Um, but now you've created urgency that didn't necessarily need to be there. So you always want to stop and pause. Goes back to our conversation around managing expectations and clarifying expectations and ask, you know, when do you need this by? And then I'll have some conversation around that. So you're not inadvertently creating too much urgency. All right, so now we're gonna move into this idea of properly creating urgency. How do we actually do this the right way? Uh, and I'm gonna start by uh, sharing with you this kind of this famous kind of eight steps to leading change model from uh, John Cotter. If you haven't heard of John Cotter before, um, he's kind of a famous change guru up at Harvard. He's been researching and studying and consulting and writing books on leading change for decades. And I love this uh, model here because it's nice and simple, clean and easy. He says, if we really want to lead change, get people to change, we want to follow these kind of eight steps. So first, we want to create a sense of urgency. Then we pull together a powerful team, create clear, simple, uplifting visions and strategies, communicate, 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 empower people by removing obstacles, create short-term wins, providing momentum, uh, maintain momentum by keeping urgency up and false pride down. So again, urgency comes up again at step number seven, and then make changes stick by nurturing a new culture. So uh, I, love, I love this model, but what I really want to highlight for us today is that notice the urgency is in here twice, but even more importantly, notice the urgency is the first step. So um, this was some years ago, and John Connor was interviewed by a, a journalist on urgency. And the journalist asked John, uh, okay, John, when, when, when change initiatives fail or managers are unsuccessful in getting people to change or leading change initiatives, why? And you can see his response was, well, managers under communicate and often not by a small amount, or they send inconsistent messages. It goes back to our idea of consistency again. Consistency is really important. The net result is the same, a stall transformation. So then the journalist was really astute and they followed up and said, okay, John, I hear you on all this. But if you really had to isolate the big two ingredients to effective kind of change, what are they? And this was his answer. He said, uh, you gotta have these two things. The urgency rate has got to be high enough. When it's not high enough, it fails. And the message has to be simple and sticky enough. If it's too complicated, that's also not gonna help. So let's talk a little about this idea of urgency rate um, and not being high enough. So um, I'm gonna take off my kind of uh, facilitator hat here. I'm gonna throw on my therapist hat. Um, and I want to ask you this question just to kind of think about for a moment. When you feel urgency, what do you feel? What are words or phrases that come to mind for you? Now, when I ask that question to groups, usually I get answers like stress, um, pressure, um, anxiety. Um, sometimes it, it can also be positive things, excitement. So urgency is a high energy emotion. And the clinical bucket for urgency is anxiety. Okay, so we're actually creating anxiety. We're going to put that into people, create that level of anxiety. And as we know, a little bit of anxiety, um, why we do this is because urgency used in the right way stimulates action. Because our natural coping mechanism, when you think about times when you've had urgency or, or anxiety at work, you think about times you've maybe woken up in the middle of the night thinking about work. Well, how, how did you cope with that? You probably grabbed a piece of paper and kind of wrote down you know, what steps you need to take or created a plan or just got up and started working. Right? So it stimulates a do response in us if we use it in the right amount. If we use it too much, we get overwhelmed, we get shut down, we kind of just, just curl up into a ball and we can't function. So it's all about knowing the right amount of urgency. So here are a couple kind of uh, principles that can help along this journey. So uh, 
uh, I'll kind of, we'll, we'll start with um, kind of the first one on the left and kind of work our way to the right. So urgency is about intentionally creating a state of discomfort so that people are ready for change. So I do I want to hit this point again because it's a really important one. You, when you're doing this, you're going to make people uncomfortable. Uh, so just steal yourself for that. That's when we're doing this the right way, that's kind of what we're doing. The messenger matters. The audience needs to trust the person creating urgency. We've talked about that. Now here's some things we haven't talked about yet. You can't have urgency without a time frame in which to take action. So you can't say, hey, we need to kind of get this initiative done here sometime soon. That's not urgency. You've got to say, we have 60 days. We have six days. We have six hours. So we've got to kind of create a time frame. That's what prompts urgency. Um, so my, my, my kids always laugh at me on this ever, and they make fun of me because now they're all teenagers and my daughter's off to college now and I've got two teenage boys at home. Uh, and every year, what really stimulates me and gets me going back into the gym and working out is when I set my annual physical. So my annual physical creates urgency for me because I say, gosh, I want to go into that annual physical and I really want to be in good shape. So then I better start working out now if I've got it in three months. So, uh, naturally they make, they make fun of me about that but that's urgency i'm creating that deadline um urgency is like hot sauce you only need a few drops and so um you can see at the bottom it's referenced it's it's my new book the hot sauce principle and and the reason for the title is it's all about urgency because urgency really is about hot sauce and why i love that image and analogy it just works so easily because um you know a little bit of hot sauce adds flavor adds spice to our life um, and, and can make, make a bland dish really taste good. Um, you put too much and we feel overwhelmed. So, you know, and, and so there, there are, and um, so we've got to make sure we're managing that. And what makes it really challenging and interesting is some of our team members, they only need a little bit of hot sauce. They just need a few drops of this and they are really, really in good shape. And then we've got other team members and they need about that much hot sauce. And knowing how much to put on that particular person's tongue and the, and the situation that it calls for is also important. Because ultimately, what we're trying to do here is uh, drive action. So when we are using urgency to drive action, we don't want to completely cover everything in hot sauce. We want just enough so that we can ultimately um, get them ready for an action plan. So you can see the last point on the far right there is, you know, if we were kind of trying to motivate a group, we would do something that created urgency in the beginning of why this is important, but then we spend nine, and that's 10% of the conversation, get them ready, and the remaining 90%, we're gonna talk about the action plan, right? We're gonna talk about like, oh my gosh, there's this urgency, I've gotta lose weight, and then the rest of my time is gonna be talking about the, the workout plan that uh, I've gotta kind of act on. So that's, that's the goal. Brandon, I've got a question here for you. So as you know, it, uh, one of our participants comments, it could be a risky proposition to uh, make people uncomfortable. What advice can you offer about things we could ask ourselves to ensure we are setting up for productive discomfort instead of destructive discomfort? So you're the distinction between maybe communicating to the entire team to create urgency versus that, as you say, the individual little teeny bit of hot sauce versus a lot of hot sauce on individuals. Yeah. So um, we're going to stick with the kind of the hot sauce analogy. So I've got, this is Tabasco and I, I think Tabasco is pretty darn hot. If I get enough of this on my, on my food, I will start sweating quick. Uh, I wouldn't start with Tabasco. I would start with maybe Frank's red hot sauce or Louisiana hot sauce or something that's a little bit lighter. So work your way up to more heat because you're right. You, you don't want to over overstate. And, and if you've got a group that is kind of, um, that's been there a long time, they're very tenured and they've kind of got their way of doing things, they're gonna be very resistant to urgency and hot sauce. So I would, I would do a, a two prong approach. I would start with Frank's or something not quite so hot and then I would do it um, individually. So there's, there's a concept called pre-wiring and pre-wiring is when you, you think you're gonna in, encounter some political resistance and the idea is you kind of pick off individuals that you can pre-wire. And those might be people that are, you know, uh, well-respected um, leaders of the group that you could kind of get to bring the, on your side. But then you also want to pre-wire those vocal players, those people that you just know are going to cause issues. So I would kind of do, I would start with light urgency and I would pick off some pre-wire some people to get you some good advocates and supporters. So then when you've got to go to the whole group, you're, 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 you're feeling pretty comfortable uh, at the right pace. Um, because you're right, it is a risky proposition because if we go too far, 
and we put way too much hot sauce, we could lose the group. They could, they, they could just turn on us and say, uh-uh, this is way too uncomfortable um, and I don't, I don't trust this person or think that they're, they're right in this. Great question. Uh, okay, so another way that we can also kind of create urgency um, is um, by telling kind of stories. So there are two types of urgency that can motivate people. Worst case scenario, which we're gonna talk about here, and opportunity scenario. Okay, so worst case scenario is if we don't change, we're all gonna die or some version of that, right? If we don't make these changes in the company, we're gonna go under. Uh, and you can think about so many, so many folks in the hospitality industry, that's the urgency they're facing right now. Whether restaurants or hotels or event spaces, I mean, they're really thinking about how do we innovate in order to survive. Um, on the other hand, opportunity scenario would be, we've got this you know, amazing opportunity that's just popped up in front of us. And we better move right now because if we don't move now, our competitors are going to grab it or the window's going to close. And, and you, could do, you could do both. So even you think about kind of how our world has flipped upside down in, in the last four or five months, it's both um, worst case scenario and opportunity. So, oh my gosh, our business model has changed. All these things have happened. But now all of a sudden people's needs are different. And if we can pivot, we might find a new market space or we might find a new way to engage customers. So, um, and, and if you're not clear on what some of those ideas are, or, or you don't have a clear worst case scenario, you can use stories of other companies that didn't innovate uh, or adjust. So I always love the Kodak story as the, as, the, as the best example. So if we were to go back in time to the early 80s, um, Kodak was the second most recognizable brand across the globe. Um, only Coca-Cola was more recognizable than Kodak. They had huge brand equity. They were the leading player in kind of the film space uh, and just a tremendously powerful company. Uh, so we go into the now the early 90s and they have a new technological disruption, digital imaging, okay? And so, you know, imagine if you were kind of the leadership team of, of Kodak back in the 90s, if you were guiding through that challenge with kind of a clear sense of your corporate purpose, uh, you might have handled things differently. So if we think about Kodak's purpose, it's to preserve memories. So then if you're kind of using that as a lens to which to look at this technological disruption, you would say, oh, wow, well, we could leverage this to further our purpose and keep us relevant for the next 50 years. But if you confuse your purpose with your product and you say, no, 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 our purpose is to sell film, then you push up against innovation and technology which is what they did. They, they tried to discount film. They tried to get people to only use film and you can see what happened. It's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a shadow of what, it, kind of what it was. So using kind of stories of, of companies that didn't embrace change, didn't adjust and pivot and, the, and they essentially died uh, can be another way to kind of motivate people and create that, create that urgency. It can be almost a mantra. Let's don't be the next Kodak, for example. So um, a few more kind of things I want to share with us, and then we'll, we'll move to questions. So uh, here's another question here. How do you kind of ensure that you don't make everything urgent with your team? So one of the, um, as I was working with a, a client several years ago, he had a small technology business, probably about 50 employees, and he was notorious for making everything urgent all the time. He was just a really anxious guy, and that anxiety just bled into the business and and it was people really kind of always felt stressed out and burned out working for him because he was always anxious and everything was urgent all the time so i gave him a little bottle of hot sauce like this as kind of a reminder this is this is urgency sit this on your desk so you want to be cautious and careful about what you put this on what most leaders do particularly in big publicly traded companies is they send everything out of their kitchen with this on it because they feel all this pressure from the shareholders to change and pivot and so that anxiety, they just push into the company, which is not the right thing to do. So, so the appetizer's covered in hot sauce, the salad's covered in hot sauce, the entree's covered in hot sauce, the chocolate brownie at the end's covered in hot sauce, and the iced tea's covered in hot sauce. And they pat themselves on the back and say, oh, I'm a great leader. And, and they've actually created way more chaos in, in the company and a lack of focus. And then they get you know, puzzled as to why things weren't accomplished. So what my client did, and I thought this was brilliant, is he went out and he bought three bottles of hot sauce. So instead of taking my little one, he bought three bottles that were a little bit bigger, like this one, and he stuck them on his desk. One, two, three. And every time there was an urgent initiative, he would give the initiative to his direct report, and then he would hand them a bottle of hot sauce that they had to hold on to until the initiative was completed. 
And what that did for him was it created kind of a forcing mechanism. He only had three bottles he could give out at any given time. There's only three things he could make urgent. So one of the ways you can kind of manage urgency with your teams is either mentally or physically create a three hot, hot sauce bottle rule where only three things can be urgent at a time. And then when that initiative gets done and it's completed, you get the bottle back and then you have a new bottle you can hand out to something else. So a nice little forcing mechanism so you can keep it under control. The, the leaders that are the most successful today are the ones that operate off of either between three to five priorities. They are very clear what their priorities are. They're very clear what's urgent. And it is limited to, to three and at the most five. Those are the most effective leaders. The ones that everything's urgent, we're, we're behind everybody on everything, that's, that's, a, that's a chaotic leader. They may think they're doing a good job, but they're, they lack focus with their people. So no one really knows what really matters. Uh, so final kind of point around kind of the idea of leading change. Um, John Cotter also mentioned this other idea of the message has to be simple and sticky enough. Uh, and so this is just some other, this kind of nod to Chip Heath and Dan Heath's book, Made to Stick, a, a really good read and how you can kind of be more effective leader, leadership communicator. Um, and so here's a couple points. Um, effective leaders are masters of simplicity, which is, which is really hard to do. How do we really boil it down to a really clear statement that can be repeatable? Uh, effective sticky messages are, are concrete. So it really clearly communicates kind of what people need to be doing and then include a story. Stories make it real. Stories help with urgency, but stories also help with kind of action that we need to take uh, going forward. So uh, we're, we're getting close here to the, uh, the end of the hour here. And so uh, as I mentioned to you, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on uh, integration. And, and so um, this is something, if, if you'd like to do, you can do this in the um, Q&A kind of feature. Uh, if you just have a comment or something that really resonated with you that you'd kind of like to share, but you can also open up for any questions that you might have of me with our re remaining time left. So you've got kind of two options. You can just share a concept that you really like today that kind of stuck with you as a, as a way to kind of make sure you, you leave with it, um, or you can ask a question. Brandon, I've got a few questions for you here. Okay. So while folks are thinking about that and want to pop any ideas into the chat, that would be great. So the first one is, I oversee transformation projects, high growth, international, restructuring, M&A integration type things. I have found entering new organizations that people and teams don't know how to accept the change paradigm, so you get that typical deer in headlights view. Uh, I know this challenge falls into the trust equation as the pattern of behaviors is such a big, big change. Do you have some recommended approaches to shorten the time in generating trust? Yeah, okay. So let's talk about perfect world and let's talk about the real world. In, in the perfect world, the way you would move on that trust formula is it takes about six months to really fully gain trust in order to um, kind of then start to create change and, and drive urgency. That's why in a perfect world, we often say, you know, a leader takes a new job, you know, day one, she or he shouldn't be upsetting the apple cart. They should spend time kind of learning the people, learning the systems, learning the culture, learning the legacy, um, and then slowly working in change about the six month mark. Now, um, if you're in, say, M as you mentioned, M&A, and, and a lot of those situations are pure transformation. We've been thinking about our friends in kind of the private equity world. They're buying something and they're immediately going to go in there and start making changes. Um, the, you've got to make sure if, if we don't have that window of time to build trust and we've got to build kind of trust as we go, the, it has to be really clearly articulated why this change has to happen. So I would highly leverage the worst case scenario. So to say to people, you know, you, you, you don't realize it, but this is kind of the path we're on. And if we don't start right now, you know, bad stuff's going to happen in six months. I remember I was working with a, uh, a consultant to physicians sometime years ago, and he said, physicians, while they're amazing at being physicians, they aren't necessarily always effective at running their practices. He said, you would be stunned at the number of physicians I go in and start looking in their books, and they're, they're broke. They don't even realize it. They're out of business, but they just keep on practicing. So being able to communicate that highly urgent message and kind of that worst case scenario is really important. So, and, and so what might that look like? It could really even be a one chart showing kind of since six months, here we are off the cliff. 
and, 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 and everyone's going to lose their job and, and this is going to impact you and your families and the community. So we've really got to make a change. So that'd be the last thing I'd add to this too. As quickly as you can, try and identify what is that true value for them that matters the most. Um, I was working with kind of a manufacturing facility a couple of years ago. And in that facility, their culture was that um, family members would go work there for generations. So sons and daughters would go follow their parents into the facility. And you might have three generations working in there. So for them, the reason for change was this place is like our home. This is how our family makes money. So if we really want to preserve it for legacies to come, um, we've got to make the change. It was less about improving the product and more about preserving that legacy for them. So finding that is also an important point. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, one of our participants has said, you know, what if you have defined your three to five things that are most urgent for your team and your leader gives you three more that you feel might not be as urgent? What advice do you have there? Yeah, so great question. So now we're getting competing demands and now we don't wanna leave with 10 things. So we have to have a really healthy trade-off conversation with our leader. Say, absolutely leader, I I'm happy to do these things for you here, but that means we can't get these things done over here. Are you okay with that, with that trade-off? Um, or you can give me more resources. So I, I think being really, really firm on that. I think the biggest no-no we can do is overcommit because it'll, it'll result in either burnout or it will result in us damaging our own credibility when we don't deliver. So be firm and have that trade-off conversation. And, and remember, manage them like a client. If they were your client and they wanted five more things added to the, the proposal or statement of work that they've already agreed upon, you'd come back to them and say, hey, Mr. and Ms. Client, I'm happy to do that for you, but it's gonna cost you more. So just hold that mentality in your mind. It's, it's my leader is my client. How do I manage them properly? So uh, I, I can deliver on their expectations and, and also not burn myself out and my team out. Great, thank you, Brandon. We've got time for one more kind of really short answer. I thought this was a great question. How do meetings and especially video conferences during these COVID times kind of create or, or they use the word defect urgency, you know, negatively impact? How do you leverage meetings in today's world to advance specific change efforts? especially in this two-dimensional video world? Yeah, it's, uh, it's challenging. So uh, the, the, my, my encouragement would be try lots of other ways to get that energy across. So the reason why meetings are not as effective as in person is it's hard to transmit as much energy as we would maybe in person. You know, people can't feel what we're feeling. So I would, th I would try and um, not only you know, really bring energy to the meetings, like how hopefully you're experiencing for me today, but think about how you might show a video or get a customer quote or video of a customer talking about why this matters. Kind of be creative on the kind of the different channels and avenues you do to stimulate that energy because that's the key. That's what's missing in our kind of video world. Uh, okay, so I know that was our, our, our time for our last question. Uh, just a quick nod, this is my book, The Hot Sauce Principles. If you haven't checked it out, I, I sure hope you have time to, to do that. Uh, it's available on, on Amazon. And, and now I'm gonna hand the baton over to Jasmine for a few like closing logistics. Yes, thank you so much, Brandon. All right, so as we wrap up today's session, we wanna thank you so much, Brandon, for sharing your thought-provoking insights with us today. Um, and a huge thank you goes out to our attendees. So many of you have joined us each and every Thursday and have offered such insightful questions and comments. We appreciate you for taking the time out and spending it with us. Um, and of course, a big thank to the executive education team for putting this on each and every Thursday. We just wanna share a couple of things with you. Next Thursday morning, Business Over Breakfast series will continue with a fireside chat conversation between retired Lieutenant General Ken Keen and our very own Chief Corporate Learning Officer, Nicola Barrett, on Commander's Intent. Um, Brandon intro introduced um, this idea at the start of today's session, and Ken will translate the wealth of, the wealth of military experience um, into, to the, into leadership lessons for today's business leaders. Uh, we will kick off September, welcoming Professor Tom Smith back for an update on the economy and me. As always, a recording 
of today's session will be available on the Executive Education's LinkedIn page. Um, and so if we just ask for a few minutes of your time to fill out this brief survey about your experience today. And Brandon, I am going to kick it back to you for any closing remarks. Again, thank you all so much. Uh, thank you. So I, I will just say thank you for joining us today. I really uh, enjoyed my time with you all. Hopefully you found some value in this today. And so as I mentioned in the very beginning, my, my challenge to you is kind of identifying that one item that you want to take away from today and, and put into play. Maybe that's the trust formula or the idea of the three hot sauce bottles or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but regardless, uh, I think being able to manage urgency today is one of those things that will help us kind of move the needle forward. So um, thank you everybody for your time. Uh, once you get a, if you get a moment to fill out the survey, that would be wonderful uh, and have a great rest of your week.